In December 1926, the American novelist Theodore Dreiser received a letter from the USSR, a country at the time uh, still awaiting diplomatic recognition by the United States, which would only follow in 1933. Its author was a 27-year-old literary critic from Moscow named Sergei Sergeyevich Dinamov. And uh, he wrote, he told Dreiser, I think you are the greatest writer in the world. And he went on to ask, um, you don't like capital and capitalism, but what do you want to have instead of them, socialism or communism? To what social destruction do you see salvation from the contemporary social position? What do you think about Soviet Russia? To readers interested in Dreiser's political views, uh, which isn't just me, I think there are other people out there as well, um, Dreiser's reply published in a collection of correspondence in 1950, was somewhat disappointing. Dreiser replies, Until that intelligence which runs this show sees fit to remould the nature of man, I think it will always be the survival of the fittest, whether in the monarchies of England, the democracies of America, or the Soviets of Russia. Um, this is disappointing. It's read as evidence of Dreiser's immersion in 19th century views of universal human nature. But in a typically Dreiserian reversal, he goes on. In conclusion, I want to say that I know so little of the truth of conditions in Russia, I would not venture an opinion as to the ultimate result. But I do hope that something fine and big and enduring does come out of it. This wish, of course, mirrored Dreiser's interest, sorry, mirrored Dinamov's interest in American literature as a Soviet literary critic, and the cross-cultural interest that would sustain their correspondence for a decade, as well as invoking its primary historical context. As Peter Filane has argued, already by the 1920s, the United States and the USSR were locked in parallel projects of modernity that were in general highly self-reflexive and at times messianic. Opponents, as Philane puts it, whose values tended to overlap at crucial points. The Soviets preached un-American atheism, collectivism and class dictatorship, but they also preached efficiency, progress and democracy of a sort. And they did so with the messianic fervor and invocation of historical destiny, which had become characteristic of American ideals. This parallel, of course, suggests the apparent paradox whereby the apparent collapse of capitalism during the Great Depression led Americans from diverse social, political and economic positions to a more positive view of the Soviet Union, just as the Soviet Union was itself becoming um, least American uh, in the, uh, under Stalinist repression. Uh, in the 30s, um, a, a swathe of Americans uh, view, looked to the USSR with renewed interest from um, corporate executives desperate for new markets for American products um, to uh, liberals to workers interested in you know, the Soviet, what was called across America the Soviet experiment. This example uh, highlights how projection uh, is a really important part in cross-cultural perceptions. Um, the notion that the U.S. views of the USSR were wholly conditioned by U.S. circumstances. And, and I think we need to be aware of that, but the tenor of what I have to say uh, is to go against that and to look for uh, the variegated possibilities of cultural exchange in the correspondence between Dinamov and Dreiser. I want to examine two main areas in which the to and fro of cultural exchange is played out. I'll come later to the ways in which their correspondence engages issues of literature and criticism. First, I want to give some flavour of the tone and discursive range of the letters, and, and particularly in terms of the somewhat gendered friendship that they betoken. A friendship consolidated in the winter of 1928 during Dreiser's visit to the USSR, when Dinamov accompanied him on various visits around Moscow to the theatre, to the Bolshoi Ballet, and welcomed Dreiser into his home, described in Dreiser's diary as three shabby rooms in an industrial district. Occasionally, Dinamov's letters cover personal topics. He slips into one letter 
on page two and that he's become a father eight weeks earlier. He reminisces about working as a butcher before the revolution. Uh, he was age 12 at the time. And in September 1935, he could not help crowing over the success of the Russian national football team. In June 1937, he wrote, Dear Dreiser, I'm glad to inform you that the Soviet expedition to the North Pole has taken along your book, American Tragedy. Um, it's a big book. One wonders whether um, polar explorers really wanted a, a, a 200,000 page double-decker volume uh, with them. But um, Ivan Papanin's book, Life on an Ice Flow, the official book of the expedition, confirms that they read Gorky, Dreiser and Balzac, as well as listening to the opera on the wireless. Against this background of friendship and mutual support, the relationship between Dreiser and Dinamov began and continued as one between enthusiastic critic and established writer. And it's in the multi-layering of their debates and arguments that I think the continuing interest of the correspondence lies. In letters to mutual friends, Dreiser expressed great affection for Dinamov and solicitude on his behalf. And occasionally this comes through directly. Uh, at one point he assures Dinamov that he is destined for great things, to be a big man extremely useful to his nation. Yet Dreiser was a notoriously irascible and gloomy correspondent. And his tone is often bantering, even hectoring, uh, taking up similarly reductive and critical positions to those he used in 1928 when interrogating Russian of officials such as Bukharin. Uh, and he seems to scoff at elements of Dinamov's critical project, um, especially his notion of having Russian workers read Shakespeare. Yet, as their mutual friend Ruth Kennel, an American who spent a long, spent a long time in the, United, in the USSR, much of this argument is an argument Dreiser was having with himself, as well as with Dinamov. Dinamov's side of the correspondence is similarly split. He is often effusive. He calls Dreiser dear and professes love to him. On October the 4th, 1929, he says, It is very strange. You are for me like a best friend. Only some days we were together, only few hours we talked. Only two years we know one another but it's quite enough for me to think about you as my good big friend. But Dinamov is also a harsh critic. Sending a copy of his published review of Dreiser's book, Twelve Men, he adds, believe me, Dreiser, I have written some words here with pain in my heart. Dreiser's fatalistic perception that social problems were inevitable, Dinamov had argued, marked him as a pretty bourgeois writer. In December 1932, Dinamov is very disappointed with the first edition of the American Spectator, a literary newspaper co-edited by Dreiser, and accuses him of backsliding, looking to capitalist organisations such as the courts and the government to improve conditions for the poor and the racially oppressed. In the same letter, Dinamov enclosed a preface he'd just written to the Russian edition of the Titan. Dreiser had it translated from Russian to English, only to discover that Dinamov had come to the conclusion that his perspective was, again, typically petty bourgeois. This combination is, is addressed explicitly by Dinamov in a letter of October 1933. Um, he says, I have met ten days with you, but I remember them like a first love, which never returns, although you always think that it has returned in the last love. But all this does not prevent me from disagreeing with you, or rather, it helps me to dispute with you, because good relations are the best foundation for discussion, etc. And they have the launches in a political discussion. And he then takes on Dreiser's question from a previous letter, you know, why are you teaching Shakespeare? Or why, why are you interested? What has Shakespeare got to say to Russian proletarians? And his answer is, only Marxism, not dead and scholastic, but living like the smell of violets, can give a basis for an understanding of Shakespeare. Um, and it's, it's kind of hard to understand what, where he's coming from with this and, and what his critical position is. It's amplified in other letters in which he talks about um, Russian workers as being the ideal readers 
of Shakespeare and indeed of American literature because they are, as he puts it, reading out of love and reading for the future. I think what Dinamov's trying to get at here is, is, is what's late, what later literary criticism has, has talked about in terms of literature as staging an encounter with the other. In particular, an encounter between an encounter with a perception of an alternative modernity. Uh, and I think that's what's happening in the dynamic between them. And you know, that could be interesting, that, that, that's worth exploring perhaps another day. What I want to move towards an end by considering is how Dinamov pursued these ideas while at the same time being imbricated within an increasingly state-directed bureaucracy and one which since from 1932 onwards had officially promulgated the very restrictive aesthetic theory of socialist realism. And to do that, I just want to go back a little bit into Dinamov's career um, and I'm going to draw here upon the work of uh, Arthur Caschiato, who's, who's researched Dinamo's biography. Born in 1901, Dinamov was the son of a labourer and a textile worker. At 14, he started work in the Moscow textile mills alongside his mother. And at 18, he became one of the first Bolshevik deputies in the Moscow Soviet, having served in the Red Army. He rose steadily in the Communist Party. In April 1928, he told Dreiser that I am now a very important man here in my field, and it is very heavy. Presumably, we can relate to the latter half of that, anyway. In May 1932, Dinoff was a signatory to the order implementing Politburo policy to centralise the various unions of cultural producers, notably of music, the arts and architecture. And this was the organisational element of the policy promulgating socialist realism. Although he was omitted from the 18-person organising committee of the new Union of Soviet Writers, in 1935, Dinamov was appointed editor-in-chief of International Literature, the official journal of the International Union of Revolutionary Writers. As editor-in-chief of International Literature, Dinamov continued what amounted to his life's work as a critic, which was to place a series of British and American writers before readers in the USSR. He did this by overseeing translations and in works of criticism. As the head of the Anglo-American section of Gozizdat, the state publishing house, he edited and wrote prefaces for a Soviet edition of Dreiser's works, the first uniform edition of Dreiser's novels, e novels published anywhere. He translated and wrote books and critical essays on, among others, Goethe, Nath Nathaniel Hawthorne, Edgar Allan Poe, Charles Brockton Brown, Mark Twain, John Galsworthy, and most influentially on Shakespeare, whose reputation in Russia <coughs> he decisively shaped. This interest and this approach would seem to be diametrically opposed to the totalitarian aesthetics of socialist realism. Yet Dynam Dynamov was able somehow to maintain his career, at least for a while. He told Dreiser in December 1935 that he had been appointed president of the Institute of Red Professors, in the same letter, he encloses a copy of an official announcement that the IURW, the uh, International Union of Revolutionary Writers, upon whose note paper he had been writing, um, had been dissolved. So the IURW had been dissolved uh, and liquidated and replaced by the International Association of Writers for the Defense of Culture. Um, this was a, the, the ideological uh, effect of the promulgation of socialist realism and it marked a move also to integrate aesthetics to a political reorientation. The IURW was anti-capitalist. The new Association of Writers for Defense of Culture was anti-fascist. So it's a movement in Soviet history towards a popular front moment and one in which... Um, I call it a, totali a totalitarian aesthetics because the notion is that uh, it, it's the antithesis of Dinamov's encounter with otherness in literature. Lit literature and other forms of cultural production are associated with a genetic politicised form and it's the politics of the form which determines it. It's not arguable, it's not an encounter, that's what it is. 
Dinamos' last letter to Dreiser is dated June 1937. In December, Dreiser wrote, anxiously asking, I haven't heard from you for so long that I wonder what's become of you. I'd like to know how the world looks to you from where you are. From here, everything seems dark and threatening indeed. In 1944, Dreiser was still asking a mutual friend about Dinamov's welfare and whereabouts. According to research done by Caschiato, Dinamov had been arrested by Stalin's secret police and he died in prison on the 20th of November 1939. It's hard to discover exactly what happened. However, a discovery by the Russian critic Arlen Viktorovich Bloom may shed some light. In the archives of the Russian Federation, Bloom found the following letter from Dinamov, written weeks before his last letter to Dreiser. It's reminiscent in many ways of his first. So I'm just going to read the, the letter out. May 31st, 1937. Dear Mr. Orwell, I have read the review of your new book, The Road to Wigan Pier, and found it extremely interesting. Would you be so kind as to send us a copy of this book that would allow us to present it to Russian readers, at least to the readers of Russian editions of the magazine International Literature? With thanks in advance, yours truly, S. Dinamov, Editor-in-Chief. Uh, so, Orwell replies, um, 2nd of the 7th, 37. Dear comrade, I'm sorry not to have answered earlier your letter dated May the 31st, but I've only just got back from Spain, and my letters have been kept for me here, rather luckily, as some, otherwise some of them might have been lost. I'm sending separately a copy of The Road to Wigan Pier. I hope parts of it may interest you. I have still not quite recovered from the wound I got in Spain, but when I'm up to writing again, I will try and write something for you as you suggested. I would like to be frank with you, however, and therefore I must tell you that in Spain I was serving in the militia of the POUM, which, as you no doubt know, has been bitterly denounced by the Communist Party and was recently suppressed by the government. Also that after what I have seen, I am more in agreement with the policy of the POUM than, that, than with that of the Communist Party. I tell you this because it may be that your paper would not care to have contributions from a POUM member, and I do not wish to introduce myself to you under false pretenses. Orwell didn't get a reply from uh, Dinamov, who had been replaced as editor-in-chief of international literature. Eventually, he received this. Mr George Orwell, Sir, the editorial office of the international literature has received your letter in which you answer our letter dated May 31st. You are right to be frank with us. You are right to inform us of your service in the militia of the POUM. <clears throat> our magazine, indeed, has nothing to do with POUM members. This organisation, as the long experience of Spanish people's struggle has shown, is part of Franco's fifth column, which is acting in the rear of the heroic army of Republican Spain, international literature. Did Dinamov know when he wrote to Orwell? that this was going to happen? I don't think so. Did he know Orwell's sympathies had changed? Did he know Orwell would have become anathema, a crypto-fascist to the Stalinist state? We can't know. But the tension that Dinamov, that had been throughout Dinamov's career in terms of his openness and his literary positioning, in a sense, made that moment inevitable, perhaps. Thanks.